if you could help others to find the power to heal themselves, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. When I started teaching my classes, it was in 2002, and I was just doing past life regressions and contacting the subconscious part. But then as the time went on and we found how powerful this was and what we could do with it, a lot of the students began saying, you know, advanced past life regression doesn't really tell what it's all about. This is so much more than that. We think you should change the name. So it was a few years ago, we decided to change the name to Quantum Healing Hypnosis Technique. Help other people to speak to their higher selves. You can. Dolores Cannon has taught thousands of people from across the world how to use QHHT. Now you can learn her method by going directly to themoreshow.com forward slash QHHT. And don't forget to mention the discount coupon More Talks. Grant Cameron, just thank you so, so much for joining us today. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for your interest in what I'm doing. Absolutely. And uh, thank you for making this happen as well. So just for the audience, just give us a very quick background on yourself. Um, I'm a researcher. I've been in it since 1975 when I had uh, sightings of an object known as Charlie Red Star. I had no interest in UFOs before it happened. I was just going because everybody said this thing was in a small town just north of the uh, American border. Uh, I had a sighting, flew right in front of the car, in real close. Um, I was blown away. The second night I went out there, two nights later, it came directly at me. And at that point, um, all I was interested in was documenting it. I documented it. Uh, nobody could have cared less. The local publisher said, Mr. Cameron, you may believe in this kind of stuff. Count me among the unbelievers. And at that point, all I was interested in was what had I seen? Somebody had to know what I had seen. And I went on this lifelong pursuit of finding out someone who had the answer to what the UFO phenomenon is all about. I've had my own signing as well. My, my whole family did, right? And maybe that did get us into doing this when it comes to respect to broadcasting, right? It's not my only, you know, passion. But um, when we had that experience, <clears throat> even nowadays, it's very difficult to talk about. We don't understand what it was. Um, you know, there was all sorts of strangeness going on when we look back, missing time. How much it changed me profoundly, I'm not sure. How much did it change you? I mean, it, obviously it did because you've taken this lifelong mm -hmm. course. Absolutely. Absolutely changed everything. I quit university. Um, I, I couldn't get enough. I was just determined to figure it out. But I've had a number of other incidents. It's just not that incident. It sort of shifted in 2012 where I have the download experience. I'm watching Colin Andrews give a lecture on crop circles, which I didn't want to be in. And I got with absolute certainty in my head, this has got to do with consciousness. And then in 2017, I had a very long sort of download procedure. And now I spend almost all my time, almost nothing on UFOs. I spend almost all my time um, on the um, study for what is actual reality. Uh, well, what is this actually uh, telling us? I still do a little bit of the government stuff because I was famous for the, the presidential UFO stuff. But in terms of does the president knows, who cares? I mean, it's not going to change anything whether he knows or he doesn't know. Uh, so the odd time I'll get dragged into the disclosure stuff. But the, the main point, as I see it now, and I've had a number of sort of intuitive experiences that have sort of led me from one to the other, is to lead me to try to explain what is reality? How, what is actually going on here? And that was the question I asked in the second night when I saw the UFO. The first night he flew right in front of the car, close enough. So it was almost like it said, Let's make sure this guy doesn't have any doubt whatsoever as to what's going on here. And so the second night, it came directly at us. It started as one object. When it got to us, it was a different object. And then it sort of made this turn, and it sort of flew away. And I remember looking at it and going, well, what's it doing? It's not and, I, and, and that stuck with me my whole life. It wasn't doing anything. And when you hear UFO stories, it's the same thing. They're really not doing anything. It is, it's almost like they want you to see, and yeah, you see. And they're, they're dragging you along with breadcrumbs from one thing to another. And that's been my life. It's been from one breadcrumb to another breadcrumb to another breadcrumb. Each book I know, I've got a big synchronicity with every book I write. And it basically tells me, here's where you're going to go next. Would you say the phenomena is maybe interdimensional? 
I, I, I would, my, my bottom line is I would go along with Deepak Chopra. Everything is an activity inside consciousness. There is only consciousness. That's all there is. It's a verb. There are no nouns. It's one big giant verb. It's all one thing. They're connected to us. We're connected to it. Uh, God did not create the heaven and the earth. God created the sparks of the divine. And we're creating the, the heaven and the earth. It's the observer principle where uh, nothing comes into a material form until it's observed. And we are the ones that are creating the universe. It's all made out of consciousness. That would be my guess at this at this moment. So doing this work all those years, all these years, should, should I say, how much has it changed you to help you with issues in your life, would you say? Not for not for main issues, but it has flipped me from time to time. And I can tell you there are numerous incidents where in my whole world just flipped upside down. The events, uh, synchronicities, where it basically instructed me where to go. But in terms of my own life, it was very hard to to have relationships. It's very hard to. Uh, it's a very lonely kind of life. In that in that sense, it basically that was my life. I mean, and my my life was over when I saw that UFO. I had. And nothing else that really mattered to me. I do this 24 seven. Uh, I don't do it for money. I could care less. Uh, to me, it's a big giant chess game that I'm, I'm here to try to figure out what this thing is. And, uh, but in terms of my life, I, you know, I, I really don't need money. I, you know, I've had a, not a, an easy life, but I've, I've had a fairly, uh, life that really wasn't, uh, affected by the phenomena. It's affected mostly relationships where, um, people, uh, have their own opinions, and I'm not here to try to convince anybody because I know that uh, belief is a big part of how the world works, that you can't change anybody else's belief. It's like Max Planck said, you do not convince your opponents that you're that you uh, that you're right by convincing them they're wrong. It moves one funeral at a time, and the new generation is not offended with the idea. So to me, it's just basically for me to take my material, to figure out what I've learned, and to put it out and uh, let that be, because if Stanton Friedman worked at this for 61 years, and he did not convince a single major skeptic. He argued with them at, at Oxford and all over the world and didn't convince anybody. People have their ideas. And so things move very slowly, one funeral at a time. And uh, they're basically, I think, just trying to, the phenomena, I believe, is trying to what I call shatter naive reality. That's what Deepak Chopra, we believe everything that we see in front of us is, is the way it is. There's an independent world uh, uh, that's out there and basically it's saying no you're not the, the world is not flat no the sun does not go around the earth and it, every time we go take another couple of steps we realize oh this is wrong this is wrong this is wrong and that's what they're doing they're basically if we believe it's a physical world they'll do things that that absolutely make you to say wow maybe that's not right and and that's what they're doing they're gradually just through this weird phenomena uh shattering our ideas of how things work and they, it's always weird uh, I call I, so the latest theory I have is called the theory of wow. All they're doing is they want you to go wow. They want you to go, what the heck did happen there? Like, why did they take every last drop of blood out of the cow? Why did they do this? And they're they're trying they're trying to get you to to uh, to shift to realize it's not the world you think it is. And the more we think, the more we discuss it, and and the more we move because science moves by curiosity. They want to keep you curious. They want to keep you moving down the road. Once we think we got all the answers, well, then it's all over. Nobody's going to do any research. So that's what I think the phenomena is doing. Where it's from, I started like everybody else, extraterrestrial. Uh, I'm now with uh, Jacques Vallée uh, saying what Jacques Vallée said. Instead of looking at what's on the screen, I'm interested in that little hole behind me where the light is coming out. And when the film is over, I'd like to get the the, the keys and get in that room and find out what's going on. And that's this idea that we're we're not really looking at real reality. We're sort of, and we're also, we're describing, we, we aren't explaining anything. That was one thing that was given to me in a download. We aren't explaining anything. We cannot describe the actual, actual reality. All we're doing is looking at uh, what Donald Hoffman would call desktop icons. We're look, looking at things that represent reality. And and the, the more we go along, the more we realize that that it is this kind of world. It may be actually as John Wheeler, the, the, the uh, uh, guy that was friends with Einstein at Princeton said, I I'm absolutely 100% in agreement that the world may be a, a, a uh, figment of the imagination. And this is a major guy. And this is this idea. Now we're starting to learn, like young kids, the idea of the of the, the matrix and the hologram and, and multidimensional stuff. We, it, when I started in 1975, it was a straight world. It was nuts and bolts. It was extraterrestrials that had gotten lost and found their way here. And as you see it, the, the, the whole phenomenon is changing in terms of what people think it is. 
And uh, it, it's a di totally different world, which people think it's the same thing. It's a completely different world. The phenomena morphs. It starts with wooden ships in 1895 and 1896 when we discovered radioactivity. And then it goes to Foo Fighters. And then it goes to Green Fireballs. Then it goes to Adamski crafts. And it has aliens that are, have, you know, or they're wearing suits. And then it goes to gray reptilians. And then reptilians in 1980. And now it's like like squares with little uh, round circles with, with squares inside them and tic tac. And, and the phenomenon is morphing. It's changing as we go along. It's never the same. There hasn't been like ground traces. There's not been a ground trace for like 25 years where he lands and burns the grass and stuff like that. And the crop circles came and they sort of went. The, the same with the cattle mutilations. They started 75 was the biggest year. Now there's almost no cattle mutilations whatsoever. It's died out. And it's almost like they're changing, the, they're turning the pages of a book. And we're just going through and we're realizing, oh, that's not right. That's not right. And as we go along, we get closer and closer to reality, but we're never, ever going to figure out what reality is. It's always going to be a desktop icon. It's going to be almost like if you followed uh, uh, um, Mike Cleland, who was the owl guy. Mike Cleland asked in one of his regressions, he said, ask me about the owls when I'm under. And then she said, well, what about the owls? He said, the owls don't mean anything. The owls are not important. The owls are just a symbol. The owls are a symbol that's on a door. It's the door that's important. When you see the symbol, you go to the door and then you say, oh, I wonder what's behind the door. And you open the door and you see this huge uh, universe that's very magnificent and stuff. And they're all they're doing is moving us from one door to the next door, open this door, open that door. And that's what we're doing. We're, we're moving from piece to piece and they're sh slowly shattering reality. They're not gonna land and tell us what's going on. That's what we do. We go into a foreign country and we say, we're here to bring you freedom, democracy, Jesus and McDonald's. And next thing you know, they're pointing guns and saying, get the hell out of here. That's what they're doing. It's slowly. They're not doing our homework, but they're gradually moving us down the road to learn and so we can learn our own lessons as to what's actually going on. Absolutely. I mean, when you consider, you know, the unfathomable, you know, unimaginable, endless idea of the universe, right, that it goes on forever. Um, I have never got that in my head. And it just, you know, always brings me back to just how how really uh, amazing everything is, right? And, uh, and, and complex. Like you say, yeah. how big the universe is. One of the main things that I've shifted in the last couple of years is this whole concept uh, of the fact that what John Wheeler that came up with black hole and wormhole theory said, there is no out there, out there. It's a participatory universe. Or the Sufis say, you see yourself as a puny form when within you is the entire universe. And then if I did a whole book on people who flow the craft, 36 people who flown the craft, and basically what they were told was, where do you want to go? And the one guy said, I'd like to see the Milky Way from a distance. And they said, okay, sit down, hold that the, your fingers into the end of that chair and think in your within yourself. It's within you, go within yourself. And he said, it took one second, he looked out the window and he was there. And it's this whole idea, there may not be any out there, out there. It's all one thing where there's no time, there's no space, it's all within ourselves. And that's where I say it's getting so much more complex that we make all these assumptions. There's there's planets out there, there's, there's this, there's that. And as we go along, we realize, no, that's not right either. That's not right either. And it may be this really complex world that it's it's absolutely like a figment of the imagination. The whole the whole thing goes back to the the Eastern traditions of Maya, that it's it's all illusion, that the only thing that's real is that which does not change. And it may be the whole paradigm is part of our consciousness awakening. Maybe they're just playing their part um, for what they think is helpful for uh, our idea of waking up in a sense right <laughs> or, or or it's us is the whole thing if it's if it's if it's one thing all as shakespeare says all the world's a stage all the men and women and aliens are but actors we have our entrance and exits and each man plays many roles and a lot of experiences will tell you that's my family this is not my family here this is my that, that's their family there or that we're part of part of them and it's this whole idea we may be the ones that are abducting ourselves we this whole thing if it's all one thing we we keep going back to these illusions there's separation there's me here there's you over there and that's what's falling apart the more you go along the more we realize like man we haven't got anything right we're just absolutely out on a limb on everything we are but there are so many people in uh just normal situations just suffering every day um w whether it's human rights or you know war or whatever it may be or just you know coming out as gay or you know issues with family issues with our with our parents our, our jobs and everything else you know these are more you know uh, the, of the issues that people are suffering from uh, or, or at least uh, you know we have to go through an experience right and they may say well the ufo phenomenon doesn't matter to me because that's not going to 
change the issues I'm going through. Now, I mean, obviously, look, I'm not saying this is true, but I mean, I've read the Seth material and I remember the Seth material saying, look, you know, this, this, the whole UFO phenomena, it, it is interdimensional and it's way beyond your understanding. Uh, you have got bigger things to be thinking about, which is, you know, your your spiritual development, your 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 the issues that you you know that you've always been you, you brought maybe even from past lives as such things exist. You're here to fix those first, right? Yeah, but but that's what I say. The UFO phenomenon is not even a UFO phenomenon. It's going to end up being a spiritual phenomenon. It's going to be what Seth said. You manifest everything around you. There is no other rule. It's it's this whole idea of the separation of the divine that we we have this idea that there's us and them and all sort of stuff. And when you come right down to it. It is the idea that they're trying to tell us, remember who you actually are. You are not, you are just an actor on a stage. You, you are not a, a podcaster. You Because you play King Henry VIII in grade 12, doesn't mean you're now King Henry VIII. We come in and we play these roles and whatever it is, and uh, the, the people have, have lessons. So I, I always say we're no different than any other social or political movement, that we have to do the work. It's not because we think we're important. Childhood cancer is important either. doesn't mean everybody should roll over and, and do everything, nothing but ch childhood cancer issues and try to solve that. It's just an, another issue. But what, what they, I think they're trying to do is this is a spiritual phenomenon. I say it's going to be way less physical than people think it is. Maybe not physical at all. It's going to be way more spiritual. And that's where I say that the people who are going to be most offended by this are not the religious people. It's going to be the scientific people who believe in this world, this materialistic world where it's, it's all nuts and bolts and there's nothing beyond. What this phenomenon is telling you is if my friend said he went 50 to 70,000 light years in one second and saw the Milky Way, that means there's something wrong with our ideas of time and space. What the what the phenomena is telling us is you've got you're missing some pieces we keep going on this idea we've got everything we've got one piece to put in and then we got it all figured out and why doesn't the government just give us that one piece and figure it out and the, the idea is the government hasn't got a clue what's going on either yeah they got hardware they got bodies they got but they have no clue it's got to do with consciousness and if you take a look at jim semivan who said who had the beings in his room and he said he said this th there is no out there out there he said the same thing uh there does not appear to be any there there he says, not only do we not know how to put the dots together, I'm not sure there's even dots to put together. And this is a guy that had the beings in his room and had this encounter and had the, the classified briefing from the government as to what's going on. And he's basically saying what I agree is that they haven't got a clue. It's just got this consciousness interface. They know that conscious, the Canadian government said in 1950 already, mental phenomena is involved. They said that in a top secret memo. So we've known the thing, but in, in order to figure it out, the consciousness thing, the government is not interested in that either. They, they want the metal. They want to make some money out of this. They want the patents. Everybody's, you know, figured we're going to make some, some bucks out of this, get some free energy, better weapons and stuff like that. But in the end, it's going to be a spiritual phenomenon. It's going to be completely spiritual. Everything is manifested. You're way ahead of your time. I think you're aware of that, right? And yeah. that, that must be yeah. difficult. That must be. But for those who are willing to listen to what you're saying, uh, it does, it's very interesting and enlightening what you're actually saying um do you think though that we're spiritually ready for no. that encounter no, no but 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 again it's if, if the world is the way it is it's eternal and it really doesn't matter we, we're in a western world where we say we want everything yesterday give us the answer let's figure this thing out and it doesn't matter it's 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 the process that that's that's involved so whether i'm farther ahead or whatever everybody has their lessons that's why i never try to convince anybody because they're that may be not their lesson they're not there that it's not important for them but for me, if you have this idea of soul contract, where you see it in a lot of the channelers and a lot of this material, this idea of soul contract, this may be the, this is what I believe is, is what I came here to do. This is what I came. And so uh, I, I'm a big Michael Newton fan, which is one of the big things that really changed my life. I saw him lecture live and I did, it was one the same as Colin Andrews. They didn't want to go in the lecture. I was daydreaming. I was just like, what? And then when he, he said this, and this is the whole idea that you come into the world and if reincarnation is a fact, which it probably is, then you and I both came in to do something. And when we leave, according to Michael Newton, all 7,000 people told him the same thing, that there's this sort of a life review where they ask you, how did it work out, Kevin? And he said, everybody says the same thing. Oh, I could have done better. All they ask you is one question. You can't bring up uh, Hillary Clinton. You can't bring up the mother-in-law. You can't bring up the dog that ate the homework. It's all about what did you do? You planned the whole thing. And how did the thing work out? And so all we have to do in, in terms of not worrying about what everybody else is doing, but worrying about why did I come into the world? And when I leave, they're going to ask me how to work out. And I got to figure out what am I here to do? And am I doing it? And nothing else matters. It doesn't matter what you're doing or anybody else is doing. It only matters to me what I'm doing at this very moment. As you're saying there, Grant, look, I can tell that you're in to your value of fulfillment. You're, you know, this is what you are 
this is what drives you. This is what where where your fulfillment is right now in your life, right? And as you say, if we go through a life review, which I do believe we do, but if we if we you know if if or we don't or we do right, if we do, um, I'm sure as you say, the most important thing I think you can say to yourself in that review is like, was I living my fulfillment? Was I doing what I really wanted to do? And as you say, whatever that is. I think that's a contribution to humanity, whatever that is, as long as it's not hurting yourself or someone else, right? As you say, it can't all be a, a cancer. It can't all be, you know, uh, human rights. It can't all be this and that, right? But this is what you're doing. Uh, and, and, and this makes sense. So, um, a, a lot of things you touched on there make a lot of sense, actually. So. Yes, you feel that we're not really spiritually. And and maybe, look, you know, everyone's talking about disclosure right now. We could be in the same situation in 50 years' time, you know, that still the government hasn't disclosed, but, the you know, the phenomena is still there. Um, yeah, I suppose people, you know, there's a lot of UFO people that want disclosure now. But as you say, we are just not ready for it, as you, as you say. Some will say they are, but I don't know. I think there's a lot of things, mundane things that we've still got to work out yet as a human species. But the, the, the people, I'd say, the people, what they want for disclosures, they want the government to stand up and tell them what they think is going on. So if they believe it's reptilians here to eat us, then that's what they want the government to say. Everybody has their their view of what it is. I think the, the, the phenomena is the one that's doing the disclosing because they're doing these bizarre things. And that's why I do the theory of, wow, why do UFOs have lights on them? They have lights on them so you can see them. They want you to see them. That's part of the game. Why did they sit in the Nimitz story and sit there for a week, almost a week? They were hovering off in the distance, waiting for the for the for the the Air Force or the Navy guys to chase them. And then when they chase them, they go, hey, Zobar, hey, go put some bubbles under the water. Here they come. And then they they go put bubbles under the water and they drop. Why would the UFO drop from 80,000 feet down to sea level in seven eighths of a second? They said, watch, watch this. You want to see something cool? And they and everybody goes how did they do that and it just gets everybody going and that's what they're doing they're doing this big show where they're like the cattle mutilation why why would they take a cow cut it into little sort of do these bizarre cuts and then take a heart and and shout and and uh, you know cut up the heart but leave their heart sack intact why would they take the brain out without doing an incision and then why would they, they got the cow and they've, they've mutilated the cow why would they fly back and drop the cow from 100 feet into the farmer's front yard and i told linda how and i told everybody else they do this because they want you to go and take photographs they, they're trying to get across a message they're doing these bizarre things that just keep hammering away at the fact that it's not the world we think it is and we we, we want to have this sort of simple world where uh, we, we get it all figured out because we live in this sort of a biblical world where you have the Stone Age and then you have the Bible and then we're at the end times. And, oh, Jesus is going to come again. And we live in this world where we think the world's about to end. And we're, we're not even close. We're, we're on our little road and, we're, and we'll go to our next thing and our next thing. And the world gets more and more complex and we add our little piece of complexity into it. And and I think that's what you see with, with Chandler's. I spent a lot of time trying to get material because I had my own download experiences of trying to find people who are in the field rather than people who are doing rational analytical left thought because you, you can have all these r people who have ideas what do you think's going on and they'll say you, you know you have 20 different opinions you're trying to find somebody who's been in the field somebody who's been on board the craft and then you find these bizarre things where they say hey the craft is bigger on the inside than it is outside it's like the outside is 30 feet across inside it's the size of a football stadium and you go that's weird that's not something would people make up or i flew the craft i put my hand on a panel and i was on the other side of the galaxy in in like instantaneously or um i i was on the craft and i could see in the 360 degrees the same as people who have near-earth experiences and out-of-body experiences and you start to realize hey this stuff's all connected all these different paranormal phenomena are the same and so you got to listen to the people who are having the experiences rather than people who have opinions it's so try to get in the right brain because that's what happened to me is i've had these experiences where i got into the into the sort of the field and i got material that came with absolute certainty and i wrote a whole book called inspired where i looked at all the inventions all the nobel prizes and everything's so all these smart guys and no no it's like all they, they got them in dreams and they got them in instant days downloads sitting on park benches and stuff and you realize that they're all the material may be in the field all the stuff is there and it's the ability to shut down the ra rational analytical ego left mind get rid of the noise and get the signal and pick up the signal and that's why experiencers and people in the field and the paranormal is so important People who are doing the paranormal stuff are people who have been in the field. They're picking up material. And if we can figure out what they're learning, what they're 
they're, they're telling us something very important about how reality actually works rather than going to people and getting their, their left brain because the small self thinks the higher self knows. And it's the idea is how do you get to the higher self to find out right. what, what the actual information is? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think with anything, you know, even channelers, you've got to use discernment, get the right ones and everything else. And even with whistleblowers, you've got to apply the discernment there as well. And I think discernment and, and having misinformation from people that are doing it for mental health issues or whatever issues they're doing it for, right, is all part of the journey. It's all part of everyone's okay. unique journey to to be able to, you know, feel or, or discern what's true okay. and what, what's but not there, true. But there are ways there are ways you can do it without trying to because that's what you, the left brain will always want to discern because the left brain wants to be in charge. Left brain says, oh, you ask me anything. I don't need to read a book. I don't need a briefing. I can tell you about anything about anything. So you got to get away from that. And that's the thing is there are certain clues. Like, for example, when someone says they're on board a ship and they were flying the ship, I remember the first woman that told me that. I thought, you're absolutely insane, lady. You are. Because I was thinking, like, I mean, Saudi Arabian women can't drive a car without a man on the car. And you're telling me you flew the craft. Come on. She was in her 70 years, 70 years old. And then you start realizing everybody else is saying it. And you see these weird things. Or the the latest book we just released, one of the books we released was on a ports. We're doing another one on uh, people who do these ports where they're coming out of their mouth and out of their eyes and stuff. And I asked the, the question. I said to my, my assistant who was filming all this stuff, I said, hey, tell me, what, let me ask you a question. Were, were the ports dry when they came out? And she said, yeah, they were. That's where you start to look, when you start looking at the experiences, you realize that there's all these little patterns. Or when channeled material, when you take someone like Paul Selleck, 11 books, 12 books, not a single word has changed. And if you were to, if you were to do our transcript of our interview through a, U- a YouTube thing, you'd see, ah, and uh, there's nothing with a real good channeler. It's absolutely clear. There's no edits that have to be made. So there are things you can determine as to whether the person is is legit or not by of, looking at enough uh, of them. Of course, and I, and I really like Paul. I think he's a fantastic channeler. He really is, right? I mean, his, his work speaks for himself. But, you know, you've got the human aspect in there as well. And I don't think his human aspect really enjo- would enjoy too much the subject of ufology. He's very, he'd be resistive. But once you get Paul out of the way, maybe something would come through. But I bet you his guides would not want to talk about that subject too much because the people that they're trying to reach are those with they're just trying to work on their human issues let alone that subject did you know what i mean i mean when you read his books i mean yeah. it's all about you know self-mastery in a but, sense but he still does give very like he does very very much give uh, if you if you know the whole story about jay-z knight with the dna that's an experiment i've been trying to do for a number of years where, where she takes the dna when she's channeling and when she's not channeling and the dna changes and then i hear paul Selleck saying Oh, you know, when I chat, when I do my psychic stuff, not the channeling stuff, when I do the psychic stuff for people, he says, you know, my eyes turn green or turn bright blue. And then he, and then they ask, what if it's your soul guide? And he said, oh, my soul guide, he has bright blue eyes. And, I, and so I'm trying to get him to do the DNA test to see, does the DNA change when he's channeling? Same as you get, a, you start seeing these patterns. If you get people who have associative uh, uh, disorder for identity, like multiple personality disorder, people say, oh, their eye color changes. Or you get uh, one of the remote viewers who is mind melding with Saddam Hussein. His eyes changed to brown when he was mind melding. And you start going, holy cow, we can learn. You, you start learning stuff by watching these people. They're giving important clues as to how reality may actually work. But it's the, it's the thing is to stay away from the rational analytical aspect of it and to see if there's these weird patterns that actually tell you something's actually going on or near-death experiences when people who are totally blind from birth can see in a near-death experience. You say, that's pretty important to understand how reality works that's that's where i'm going yes that yes i understand that and um i think when the world comes from more love when we can you know love ourselves more and each other uh maybe there will be less war <laughs> maybe there will be a, a a better you know a world that we would all <laughs> um want in a sense uh but you know maybe we come down here as souls to have the experience of everything opposite so that we can get to know ourselves maybe the, the perfection is in what's got you know is in the, the reality that we we're experiencing because away from this human body uh maybe there's nothing better to do on a Saturday night, but come to planet Earth to evolve. Yeah, well, I I, I see still our we we come as as the people who are inventing, uh, uh, creating the entire universe, and we can create negative energy and positive energy. And if we can build a physical uh, world, we can build it, build a spiritual world, and we're building it all. So we are, uh, and there there's there's uh, uh, people who are at different levels, and 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 it's just uh, a situation where. 
uh, I don't believe in this them and us where, you know, we're victims. We like the left brain likes to be the ego, the victim, and uh, everybody's out to get us. And, you know, we're having a, a rough time and other people are having a better time and stuff like that. Whatever happens to us is, is, is maybe even us that that, that is, is performance, especially if you look at Michael Newton. That's the big part of the Mike, Michael Newton literature is this whole idea that we plan a lot of this stuff that it's not happening or even in near-death experiences, for example, near-death experiences. 31% of people say at one point during their experience, they knew the answer to everything in the universe. In uh, abduction experience, is 40% say at one point during their experience, they knew the answer to everything in the universe, which would tend to indicate it's all there. And it's this sort of a, a game that's being played. And it's it's not the it's not the world we think it is. That's what's shattering, is the is the world that we've, we've put out there, that there's us and, the, and, and them. And, and when you get peace in the world, it's, it's Paul Selleck's it's division. It's, it's separating from the divine that we, we, we have you and me, I'm the good guy. You're the bad guy. And if you realize that you're all one thing, that that's why you see beings maybe so interested in nuclear weapons is that they, they, they they know that whatever we do here will affect the entire universe. And that's what they're trying to get across to us. And we say, no, it's separation. Don't tell me what to do. I can, if I want nuclear weapons, I'll do it. It doesn't affect you. Get out of here, leave us alone. And so to me, that's the, the peace in the world is that, that I say all that is, all that is evil in the modern world is created by one thing and one thing only the mistaken belief in separation. If you get rid of that, then there is no uh, war there. It's all people working together, but everybody has a role. So it's it's sort of like, you know, we, people have this idea of the karmic wheel. I'm going to get off the karmic wheel. And they say, what are you going to do? Uh, how long can you sit on a beach in Hawaii and drink Mai Tais? How many billion years do you think you can do that? It's all about experience. It's about coming in and, and having experience and stuff like that, where we have this idea where, you know, we've we've got, you know, a, a, a house, big house and, and two cars. I mean, our kids have been through university and now we need some something else. Let's get some spiritual stuff. And and we're just adding it to the pile of stuff we already have. And, and, and so for a lot of people, it's curiosity. And that's when we dealt in when the Bob Lazar, you mentioned Bob Lazar, when we were doing the Bob Lazar thing, we were dealing with a guy who was the head of the uh, chairman of the board of the Institute for Defense Analysis, top military think tank. And what he said to us when he confronted, when he was confronted, he said, yeah, I was at a briefing with, with, where they had crafts and bodies and stuff. Big deal. Leave it alone. Go do something else. And then he said, admit it. You're just curious. Why should we change the rules and the, and the regulations to satisfy your curiosity? You're just curious. And that's true. All people are they're curious. It's going to be like 15 minutes on, on Twitter. And then it's on to the next story. It's like, you know, the next story, it's just, it just moves so fast that that's all people are interested in. They just tell us, tell us what's going on. And, it, and they're not interested in, in why it's going on or, uh, I, you know, and that's the thing. That's why I say with the, with the president, it really doesn't matter whether the president knows or not. It has, it, it's totally irrelevant. It's almost like who invented COVID? Who cares who invented COVID? I mean, it's, it, you got COVID. It's a situation. Learn to, learn to deal with it, whatever, whatever your situation is. Okay. And when we when you mentioned Bob Lazar there, just off air, we had mentioned uh, Bob Lazar off air before we started recording. So um, your website is... I don't have a website anymore. I took it. I took it down. I had, I had built a a very somebody had built a very complex website for me and then disappeared and I couldn't run it anymore and I just decided no I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna try to update the website so I don't have a website I have uh, just a small site where my books are are kept and I do a lot of Facebook and Twitter and I just put out what I what I research uh, I, I basically get an idea for a book I do the book and I just put it out and then I go on I don't edit it I don't uh, have somebody else edit it. I never read anything that I've written uh, previously. I don't watch anything I've done. I d I'm always in a process of trying to figure out what the next thing is, trying to figure out what is reality and just and re recording it. So I don't, I don't really have a website. Okay. Well, we'll put that Facebook link on the screen as well. Your books are coming up on the screen as well. All the links will be in the description for this video as well. And we're going to touch upon your latest book very shortly, which is uh, Jimmy Carter, Paranormal and UFO Tales. Um, I think we should just touch on the Bob Lazar just very, very quickly. That's that, that's interesting that you, well, we, we talked about it before, but, but you just brought it up there as well. I think that there, you know, there, there has to be some discernment sometimes. And for example, my uh, next documentary, my documentary I'm working on right now is based on a whistleblower by Kerry Cassidy called Mark Richards. She calls him Captain Mark Richards. And he's um, been in prison for um, 40 years of his life. And he comes has come forward to Kerry to tell his tales about being in the secret space program. Well, making the documentary and, you know, uh, digging into the murder that he was part of and all the people involved in it. Um, it's absolutely not true. So 
there's other whistleblowers, as you say, like Bob Lazar. Now, what's happened with Bob Lazar recently is there's a, a whistleblower, well, not a whistleblower, a researcher that's come forward called Signals Intelligence. And he has spent many years on the Bob Lazar story, including that his first wife, uh, Carol, spent many years in state prison for murder back in the day before she met Bob. And his second wife, Tracy, uh, she was also um, on the run from New Mexico for committing um, bank fraud um, back in the day as well, which is part of the reason they moved to um, Las Vegas. There's no way Bob would have gone past any security clearance with married to individuals like this. Uh, it just wouldn't have happened. So the story dies off at the very, very beginning. All this um, information has just come forward all the court cases available. People that knew these people back in the day have come forward with interviews now to say that this was the truth, this is the case. Uh, the Bob Lazar story, unfortunately, I, be, I do, I, from what I see, with, with the tons of information that this guy has brought forward that no one else has before because he, he just wouldn't stop digging. Uh, it, is, it is unfortunately not true, in my opinion now, um, and many others. And it's okay because I think it's just, you know, it, it's just a journey of like, you know, I got it wrong. You know, not everything's going to be true. And there are people that you know, want to, you know, tell these tales. Um, yet, I don't want to go too much into the Bob Lazar story because it, it needs a, a show on its own right to go uh, over all the points. Well, well, let me ask you some questions then. Well, why, why would this guy have to hide behind an anonymous name? If he's if he's a whistleblower and he's exposure, why don't you just come into the open? What that that always annoys me when people have to hide behind some name and then they they put out material. The Bob Lazar thing is is clear. I mean, I sat in jo with George Knapp with long discussions. George Knapp is unfortunately Bob, not. He, so I've got to say, George Knapp is unfortunately has let himself down in the research that he did for Bob Lazar. He he has purposely um, um, closed his eyes on, on on the actual proper research, and he's just gone down the wow factor, and he got lost in his own excitement. It, he, had 25, it, he, he, has, he had 25 witnesses. He had 25 witnesses. It wasn't just Bob Lazar. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's many. I've got to say no. When you look at this and, signals intelligence and, research, you'll see what I'm, what I'm saying. Well, but this is an anonymous name. So, but, well, but, well, but yes, when yes, but when, to, you, when well, but I've, I've, I've spoken to this guy over the phone many, many times. He's actually a real human being. And actually, the research completely checks out. He's got paper. Yeah, but he's hiding behind a name. That, that, that's always a dangerous thing. That's always very dangerous. When you see his research, like the newspaper articles from the archives, that actually everything that he's that he's uh, that he's saying all but, links up. And but no, this, what, what Lazar's wife does is irrelevant. But there's they no there's no, there's no right way the there's no there's said, no way he would have got a security clearance background check with his wife having exactly. committed mur That's murder. That's the whole point. There's no That's way. That's the whole point. There's it no was, way. He, he got a security clearance. Went out right away. That's the whole point. If you want to disclose the UFO story, when Carol's when Carol's security clearance went through that. She was denied in the end because of of her of her background in serving time for state prison in murder. Exactly, exactly what I say. But you don't need a security clearance. Was he on the base? That's the, the key. No. If you want to disclose the UFO story, in his head, in Times. his head, he was. In his head, he was, but not in reality, unfortunately. He passed the lie detector tests. He 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 went he went there. If you want to disclose the UFO story, you go to the New York Times. You give them all the videos. You give them all the documents. You give them everything. They're not disclosing. So if you want the story to go out there and then blow up in everybody's face, and that's what you do is you give it to some guy like Bob Lazar, who's who's got a a, a, a pirate flag, who's got a jet car, who's got terrible background, who who had, was working at a, with a, with the, with the prostitutes. That's what you want to do. You want it to blow up, and it backfired on them because what happened? They, they they put the story out and then next thing you know everybody's up in the hills and they're looking down on top of the base and bill clinton had to go and get all this land to move people farther away because the whole thing backfired that they wanted people to know there was something going on in area 51 i mean they, they, there's so many things 25 so witnesses, what i think what you're that I, I think okay John Lear. yeah well, well, i think what you're saying grant i'm sorry to butt in i think you're saying regardless of his um bad past and the, the reason why most people if they had his past wouldn't get a security clearance what you're saying is they let him have that so that they could blow up the story in the future they, they put him on the base because the, the second day he was on the base, he describes this story of reading 125 documents. You don't read 125 documents the, the second day. They, it's a need to know program. You, they don't let you know anything except what you're working on. So that's what they do. They're feeding this material to him. When you speak to Tracy, his wife, you know, who was with him in those years, um, um, he, he wasn't doing that. I mean, you know, I mean, people will say, well, how can you trust an ex-wife? 
well, you know, she she knew him pretty well. Uh, John Lear was easily easily led by stories, um, and uh, you know, he he probably loved him as a friend. But um, again, look, I don't want to get. That was the whole idea. Yeah, that's the whole idea. They wanted it to go to John Lear. They said they said to John. He said he was on December sixth, his first day on the base. They he went to John Lear, and John Lear was signing checks. And he went and he said, "Did they know you're here? Is it? It's real. They're they're up there." And he said, "Well, get out of here. Get out of the house. You know they're going to be following you." That's exactly what they wanted. They wanted to go to John Lear because who's going to believe John Lear either? John Lear's a total nutcase. So what you do is you put stuff out to bad people, so the story floats around, so it can't be discul- You can't be verified. If they want the story to be verified, they're going to verify the story. If they want just to put out stories, they're putting stories out all the time to all sorts of bad bad witnesses and your guy who hides behind an anonymous name may be another one of these people who's just in there to add more more stuff because that's what you do if jim semivan said if we wanted you dead you would have been dead 10 years if we don't do that any stuff anymore what you do now is you put in a second story so when i had the holloman air force base story was given to me bob 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 Eminger, he said it was may of 1971 and of course richard Doty immediately came out and said no it wasn't may 1971 it was 1964 and linda started telling that story and so it's like then linda Mir arguing about When's the date of the Holloman Air Force Base story? And that's what they do. They put two different stories out there. So everybody argues about what's going on and the story gets out, but it never gets verified. That's what they're trying to do is, is to get the story out, but but keep control of the story. If they want to disclose the story, they know how to do it. The president can stand up and make an announcement. They're not going to do that. They're not going to disclose, number one, because they, they, they lose control of the, the spill of milk and they can't put it back in the, the jar, but also because they haven't got a clue. They haven't got a clue. They know this stuff's for real and, and they have hardware. But in terms of understanding it, the the intelligence is running the show. I can absolutely guarantee you that. Okay, that's that's in, okay. Well, thank you for that. And I mean, look, we've both got a different take on the Bob Lazar and what you're saying. You know, it it sounds plausible in some respects, um, but there there like I say, there is so much new evidence coming forward on the Bob Lazar case. It it just gives it a whole different direction as as to the you know um, the truthfulness of it. But then if you look at the Corey Good story, I mean, there's a there's a guy that's now taken his former um, business partners to court. He's done his uh, he's been deposed, and in the depositions, you know, he's saying that he made everything up. It was all channeled. He never he never left the planet. It was all channeled. There's so many people that come into this field that taint it for their own issues right um that you have to you just have to like i say i think the word discernment is, is an important word uh but because people you know if who would who would not believe someone that's going to come forward to say that in some respects why would you go out there to do that but then there are other issues in the head of someone going on that we don't understand sometimes that's why walker said to us you're just curious oh you, th- these are stories that have are, are not really relevant as to what's going on like who cares whether Corey good went somewhere or bob lazar was on the base or whatever these are just stories they're stories that you can make movies out of and documentaries and people are all interested in it and they it's like when you go to uh, you uh consciousness life expo and this consciousness life expo you can go and i remember Corey good was lecturing in 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 the the room there and I had like 35 people in a consciousness lecture and he had 600 people plus 100 people in the hallway who would paid like 75 or 80 bucks for a ticket. And they were furious they couldn't get in the room. And that's the thing. People love those kind of stories. That's why Walker said this is totally irrelevant stuff. I mean, whether the, he was on the base or not, it's he was how not. does reality he was work? Not. We have to get through, through looking at what, what's this really all about rather than the entertainers in the UFO field. Yes. No, I, I agree with that. No, I, I, I do. But if no one's going to, you know, lift the veil just to have a look if the story is true or not, then, um, what, you know, that's still not helping people in some respects. But where does that get us by, by you know, fighting about stories and, and exposing people and stuff like that? It, it's the not, not it's, always it's very not really far, not to, always very far. Right. But I guess it depends. Is it your passion? Is it your value of fulfillment to want to look at that story to do it? Do you know, do you know what I mean? For some people, maybe it's their it's their fulfillment to do that. It's what what's. Yeah, what for joy. it sells. Absolutely. That's what I said. When you go to Conscious Life Expo, he had 700 people paying like 80 bucks or 75 bucks or whatever to get in the room. And nobody could have cared less. I was giving a consciousness lecture about how does reality work in consciousness. Nobody could care less. People are, they're into entertainment. They're into, they're not really interested. That's what Walker said. You're just curious. Why should we change the rules to satisfy your curiosity? Go and study something else. Unless you have the mind of Einstein, you're not getting anywhere with this thing. And 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 he, he basically w- was on their principle where they're, they're working on how this works and they could care less whether the public knows it. That's the same thing I would, we're talking about the Jimmy Carter book. There's a story that was told that Jimmy Carter asked 
when he was president-elect, he went to George Bush. And George Bush said, curiosity is not sufficient need to know. And then he said, if you want those files, you should go to the House Science and Technology Committee to get the files. And he basically said, that's true. Curiosity is not sufficient need to know. The government could care less whether you know or I know. They're trying to figure out how to make weapons, how to make metals. They, they don't care. It doesn't. It, we're just in the way. And so that, that's what I think it comes down to is that um, we have to figure out what mystery are we trying to solve and, and how are we trying to move the, the, the ball. Most of the UFO community is just into straight out entertainment. And uh, it's I wish that audience could be yours. I really do. Honestly, I do. I mean that sincerely to, for you, because I, I, I know where you're coming from. And like I say, you're ahead of your time. You just are, right? Yeah, but to me, but, but to me, it's it's not about audience. I could care less about the audience. Mine is it's about to me. I always see it like a chess game. That it's you're playing a game of chess and you watch the board and you do not make a move until you know what the other guy, why he moved that piece, what's he actually up up to doing. And so to me, it's a chess game. It's about winning. It's about trying to figure this thing out because that was the thing that happened. To me. I had the first sighting very close. The second sighting, it came at me and then it made this turn and went back sort of where it came from. And I went, well, what's it doing? It's not doing anything. And then I suddenly realized like it's. It's, it's something else is going on here. This is not some alien that got lost north of the Canadian border. This is they're, they're doing something. And when you start looking at what they're doing, they're doing these really weird things where they appear in front of people and they, they do the apport thing. They make stuff fall. They, they, they put triangles. What do they put triangles on people's arms for? This is all it's been going on since the 1960s, 70s, 50s. People come and they got triangles on their bodies. Like you come what, a, a trillion galaxies away to come and, and put triangles on people's bodies or to go to Skinwalker Ranch and take the woman's groceries when she takes the groceries out and goes to the next room, comes back and the groceries are back in the bag. Like, what do you come across to do that? They're doing this weird stuff because they're trying to tell you, this is, watch this world. This is not what you think it is. It's all this this bizarre uh, sort of uh, Kafka theater thing that they're doing that's just making us, uh, um, you know, tra- question reality. And as we go along, we realize Jacques Vallée was the first to get it. He said, UFO stuff is absurd. That's exactly what it is. It's absolutely absurd. It makes no sense. And that's what they want. It's exactly, they're doing exactly what they want to do. They've probably done it on a thousand different planets before. It's to move us to the fact that the world is not the way you think it is. This is paranormal phenomena. And if the world was made out of nuts and bolts and it was just simple, this stuff would not be happening. This stuff is happening, which means something you believe is not right. And you got to figure out what it is that we're that we're mistakenly believing. And it's the idea of the physical universe, the idea that there's separation. There's all these very great things that you go back into Eastern literature, and they had it all. It's basically just a rerun of Eastern literature, the idea of Maya and the idea of consciousness or, or uh, death. You manifest what what happens around you. There is no other rule. And you see this in channeling stuff, the oneness, the manifestation thing. Uh, and then it's the you see the science is starting to back this up with the whole thing about the observer effect where you know nothing comes into physical existence until it's observed this whole idea and and uh so to me i i've changed greatly in what i what i do i i try not to spend too much time in the the whole thing about the presidents and i believe the presidents know they know uh, they know as much as anybody else. Barack Obama said, yes, we knew these films were there. We don't know what they are. And everybody says, no, no, they're lying. They're lying. No, I don't think they're lying. I think that's exactly what it is. They they have a clue. Yeah, there, there's something weird going on here and we don't control it. And uh, people want to believe in conspiracies. So they believe, oh, the government's got this all wrapped up and they've been flying crafts to star systems for 40 years or whatever. Uh, there's absolutely no, I believe any of that kind of stuff's going on. They, 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 they have little ideas about consciousness is a fact and they may have a little bit of metal stuff the uh the the whole thing with the with these uh, titanium nickel uh, stuff but if you take a look at the metal stuff what well, why do they why do why are these little pieces falling i say the, you have a ufo comes across the galaxy and then little pieces of metal start falling off the craft come on give your head a shake it's like hell put off went to hell put off i said hell this is a ports they're dropping this stuff on purpose. You were there when Yuri Geller was there, when the, Yuri Geller cuts his, his his mouth on the ice cream and, and, and he pulls it out and it's the pin from from, from uh, Edgar Mitchell's flight pin from Houston that he lost. And then they go back in the lab and 
and they're standing in the lab and Yuri Geller's in another room and they're standing there and Hal Putoff says suddenly behind them, the other piece of the pin falls behind them. That's what they're doing, this weird stuff. And I said, hell, this is, they're, they're dropping this stuff. They're, they're not. And, and, and you'll see with Jerry Nolan, they have the, the Uba Tuba piece. So he has the Uba Tuba piece and then there's two different uh, pieces from the same crash. And one, the isotopes are all messed up and the other one, the isotopes are not messed up. So what are they doing? They're just making you go, whoa, what's going on here? And they, they're, they're, they're just, they keep pushing us and telling us it's not the world you think it is. Yeah, and when you think about the whole idea of the interdimensional, well, the idea that maybe dimensions are, the veil between dimensions is so thin if we really understood it, right? And um, just... But, well, but again, I would, I would say no dimensions. I, I say it's all one thing. Well, that's the thing, is the left brain wants to do nouns. Everything is a noun. So there's dimensions, there's colors, there's, there's, there's none of that kind of stuff. It's like when you fall in the water. You fall in the water and you drop down to 150 feet and you say to the fish, what dimension am I in? What level am I on? And the fish will say, what are you, crazy? You're in the water. It's all water. And if you're in the lower part of the water, there's not as much light. The closer you get to the surface, that's the idea of getting into the higher self. You're in the dark and you, certain people can float and go lower up from the bottom of the sea. And the farther you get towards the light, towards the, the, the top of the water, the more you can see because there's more light and they can see things that we can't. That's where we got to listen to them. But there's no, there's no, there's no levels of water. It's all, it's all one thing. We're all in the same thing. And there are certain people who are at one level and we're at the other level and there's vibrations. Even Michael Newton talked about the vibrations. The lowest level of souls are red. And then he would ask them what your color and then it would be white and gold. And, and the highest level was violet. And that's the same color as the rainbow. The, the higher vibrations are those colors. The chakras all go according to those colors. And you start seeing these patterns and you go, oh, that's what they're trying to tell us. You start to see these, these patterns. But the patterns are how does reality work rather than is there some alien who got lost from Zeta Reticuli? And, 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 and I'll, I'll, I'll ask all sorts of different questions that people will. People will say when they're on the ship, oh, did, you, did they hurt you? Were you scared? I always ask these other questions like, hey. Did the alien have any clothes on? I go, no, he didn't have any clothes. Hey, don't you think that was kind of weird? Did he have any clothes on? They said, yeah, it is kind of weird. He didn't have any clothes on. Did he have any sex organs? They're raping our women, you know. Do you have any sex organs? No, come to think of it. No, there's no sex organs. And then it was like, did he ever get any older? And I've asked this to piles of experiences. Betty Andreessen, 1946, her first experience. And her husband both had 1946 experiences. And their whole life, I said, did the alien, did he ever get any older? No. And they said, well, because aliens live a long time. The left brain has makes this explanation. And you see these bizarre things. The alien should be getting older. He's not getting any older. And then it's like almost the Michael Newton thing when, when the one guy comes and he says, oh, the devil's in front of you. And Newton says, the devil? What do you mean the devil's here? And then he said, well, yeah, he's here. He's right standing right in front of you. He said, what's he look like? Oh, he's got dark skin and he's got fiery eyes. And then Newton says, what's he wearing? And he said, oh, he's got these sort of clothes. And then he, below his waist, there's just uh, sort of no clothes. And then Michael Newton says, go into the future and tell me who this actually is. And he says, oh, it's my soul guide. He's wearing a mask. And, and he's, he's mad at me because I was a, uh, a fire and brimstone preacher. And he said, now you know what it's like to be in your congregation. And that's the whole Michael Newton saying, and I say with the UFO thing, at, who is this really? If you've ever interviewed Sherry Wilde, Sherry Wilde wrote a book. It's going to be a movie now. Sherry Wilde, she has the, she puts the book to her publisher and the, the being said he was from Andromeda or some bizarre place or whatever. And then the, the publisher said, he's a gray, isn't he? He said, yeah, he's a, he's a gray, he's a Zeta. And he said, well, he can't be from there. He's got to be from Zeta Reticuli. I said, really? I said, yeah, I'll go ask him. So she goes to Don. She says, hey, are you actually an alien? And he said, no, that would not best describe who I actually am. I'm on a mission through the galaxy for the creator. I am what you would call an etheric being. So I started asking all of my experiences. I said, ask your guy if he's an, if an alien. None has ever said they were an alien when they actually get confronted. I had one uh, from Great Britain, two, they called them the beings. They wanted me to interview them. So I said, okay. So I said to them, first question, I said, hey, okay, so are you guys aliens? And they said, would you like us to be aliens? We could do that. We could be ETs if you want. We could even take you to our planet. But no, we're not. We've always been here. You're the visitor. And that's this idea that you see over and over again. We've always been here. There may not be any out there, out there. They're playing a role. You're playing a role. We're all actors on a stage. And when we leave the stage, we go on and play a different role. Or as Whitley Strieber's wife said, when they wrote the book after after she died, she comes back and she says, Whitley, I am, I am no longer Anne, but I'll always be Anne to you. It's the old idea. I'm on a different role now, but we played this role on stage. And that's the whole thing behind all the spiritual literature. Remember who you actually are. You are not the player on the stage. You're, you, that's the small self. 
that thinks the ego, you are the higher self that and that doesn't change, that goes from lifetime to lifetime. So that that's where it's changed for me. It started as a UFO thing, but I, I really don't have that much interest in, in UFOs, except to ask weird questions like, well, if aliens are so smart, if they have all this technology, why can't they invent the hair problem? I mean, they're good. They, you have the, all the evil aliens have no hair. All the good aliens have good hair. And then you start to see what John Max said to J- to uh, Bud Hopkins in in his lecture uh, when they were in Boston, they were on stage, and John Mack said, "Hey, Bud, says you know it's really weird." He says, "I'm I'm the psychiatrist here. You think I would be the one that would be getting all the real bad ones?" He said, "I'm getting all the spiritual seeking ones, and you're getting all the bad ones, and maybe that has more to do with you and I." And that's where we've got to realize we are part of the thing. We are we are in, impressing on the case our own belief system systems so people that see grays maybe people who are in fear you see the people who are very spiritual they're going to see these sort of angelic beings or light beings and stuff like that and we've got to realize a, a being that comes in there's a, a an experience by the name of yossi ronan a, a, an israeli guy who uh in he was in la had an experience and he had these green beings and they said when we come into your world we have to take on a body we don't need a body but we have to take on a world to come into your world you can do the same thing you just don't know it so they can come in as whatever they want they can be reptilians grays whatever they want and and a lot of them will change from one woman had three different beings there was one reptilian she's famous she's the first uh, abductee uh, july of 1961 and i said to her i said but nancy you said he was on board the ship was he a reptilian then oh no no he was a human being he had dark hair he's sitting on a council and now he's he's like an etheric being so it's the same being is playing three different roles during her life and and the same with the the crafts the crafts can change they can morph they can do whatever they want and so to get stuck in this physical world of trying to interpret what this is it's trying to give us the idea that reality is not what we think it is we are part of the reality we are the ones that are creating this whole thing that is you are fascinating you are so fascinating i i love um i love i love what you're saying i really do regardless of uh you know disagreement with bob lazar i don't care about that um but i do love what you what you're talking about please know that <laughs> um that's why i keep saying you're ahead of your time right let's just touch on the book just very quickly i think we should just do that as well so with um Jimmy Carter's UFO experience. Just remind the audience what that experience was. It first was made public in 1973. He filed a report that said that he had had a UFO sighting. And then it became known that it wasn't in 1973. The sighting was claimed to be 1969. He was in Leary, Georgia at a Lions Club meeting. And he was with uh, 10 other, 11 other guys outside a, a building. But when I went to the uh, Carter ar- archives to look for the documents and stuff, one of the archivists there was big time into UFOs. And he said, no, no, it wasn't 69. It was actually earlier than 69. He said, because Chip Carter, his son, we went to school, university together. And he said, he told me that story. And we were still in university. That was before 1969. So he had a UFO sighting. And then he made it public. He said he gave an a, a interview to the National Enquirer. And the National Enquirer asked him a question. And he said, I will release everything, all the files on UFOs if I'm elected president, except for the military stuff. And that's people always forget about the military stuff. And uh, so then when he became president, all the letters started flowing into the White House and said, you made the promise you're going to release the UFO files. And what I say in the book is that Jimmy Carter never would have reported if he had the chance to do it over again. He it just haunted him his whole life that he, he put this story out because pe- people went after him. And it really, as, as we brought up before, it really wasn't his interest. He was into uh, Habitat for Humanity. He was into uh, peace and he was in this didn't interest him at all. So he had this regrets, but uh, he um, uh, tr- tried to get it done. What he did is is what I say they, they try to do. If you're the president, it's like Jimmy uh, Bill Clinton said. This story is like the Arkansas Tar Baby story. It's the story about Brer Rabbit getting caught by the 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 the, the, the fox, where he makes this this. Uh, tar baby and he doesn't respond so the guy punches him in the head and he gets stuck to the tar baby and the more he tries to fight the tar baby the more he gets stuck to the tar baby and that's what bill clinton said the the ufo story is the tar baby story you don't want to get stuck to this story and jimmy carter got stuck to the story and, and he he could never shake it but what he did when he was president i looked at the files and what i say he tried to do is he tried to do it through other people so he did his press secretary go to the fbi and force the fbi to release their ufo files he had a lawyer that went to the cia because the cia had a foia against him for ufo 
UFO documents and she was trying to stop them from hiding documents and stuff like that. He got his press secretary to go to NASA and uh, to get a new blue, blue look thing. But Carter's fingerprints were never on any of this stuff. So he had his aides doing and half of all the FOIA documents, UFO documents that were ever released, were released under the Carter administration because he was very much on to openness, uh, you know, uh, sunshine is the best disinfectant, all that idea. And so he was pushing it. But in terms of the thing, he 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 didn't like it. He he did have a, an interest in paranormal phenomena. And his wife, Rosalind Carter, had a big, she was fascinated with uh, Yuri Geller. Yuri Geller had bent a spoon for her and she was fascinated with him. And he met Carter. And uh, so he, he Carter was interested in their, their house was supposed to be haunted. So that kind of stuff, Carter was kind of uh, kind of interested. And he talked about the, the biggest experience of his presidential career. And he messes the whole thing up. And I think he messes it up because he's trying to avoid uh, national security. So what he does, he says there was this plane in Africa, an American, small American plane. And it wasn't. It was a Tupolev 22 uh, supersonic Russian bomber that had been changed to a, an intelligence platform. And it had gone down in uh, Africa and this and uh, they had asked the CIA had asked for the remote viewers to find it. They couldn't find it with the satellites and two remote viewers, one from Wright Patterson, one from SRI found this plane. They told him exactly where it was and it was there. And Carter said that was the most amazing thing he'd ever seen as president. And he called her a medium and she wasn't a medium. There's actually two women. And he tells a story, but that he had this interested, but, but he had this religious belief that I think was sort of, Offended. And then I look in the book, I look at the the whole idea about uh, was he actually briefed? Did they actually tell the president what's going on? And what I came to the conclusion there that it did appear that he was briefed. But then there was a Secret Service guy who claimed that he was in the briefing. And he said Jimmy Carter was shown a 15 minute color film. And when I saw that, I went, holy cow, 15 minute color film. That must be the Holloman Air Force Base film, which is the basis of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. That's where they got the idea that Jimmy uh, Spielberg got it from a friend of mine by the name of Bob Emenegger, who did a documentary. He was given this film where they landed a UFO at Holloman Air Force Base and the story was caught on film. These aliens come out and, and they greet the officials and stuff like that. And all they do in Close Encounters is change it to Wyoming at night instead of the morning. And so uh, they, they the idea was that this film had been shown to Jimmy Carter. And that's when I said, how could this Secret Service guy know about this film? Because I knew the already knew the story that Eric Davis, who's a very prominent guy in the UFO community now uh, with UFO rumored stories and stuff like that, had talked to me 20 years ago and had told me that he had phoned up President uh, Gerald Ford and asked him, did you see the Holloman Air Force Base film during your UFO, your presidential briefing? And Ford said, yeah, I saw it. And he said, well, when was the briefing? I'm not going to tell you. Don't even go there. And he'd also phoned up George Bush. And Bush had said, he said, was it an A-12? There was all these counter explanations. Was it an A-12? Was, was it a psychological film? Was it a training film? And Bush said, no, 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 no. He said it was the real deal. And the security was immense for this project. So I already knew that this that two presidents had been shown this film of the Holloman Air Force Base film. So when I saw Jimmy Carter's uh, story that that this Secret Service guy said he'd been shown this 15 minute film. Then I, that's why I leave it in the book. I said maybe he did actually get a briefing that they showed him this kind of stuff, and he just didn't. He wanted to put it behind him. He just didn't want anything to do with it because this idea of the, his religious implications that that you know it, it affected that. And and there was a story that another story was told was he had two reports done on extraterrestrial intelligence and on ET. Uh, UFOs and ET intelligence. And in that report done by the Library of Congress, it had said that there were between two and six races visiting the Earth. So that's what I basically look in the Carter thing. And uh, it doesn't really uh, solve anything. Obama was the big guy. Obama, I've got uh, FOIs in with Obama for his files, which will be a couple of years before I can get the files. Obama was the big guy. He was really into UFOs. Uh, he's actually producing a film with his wife right now on Betty and Barney Hill. Like, I mean, you talk about a president's producing a film on an abductee. Like, what's that all about? So they, but they do it a lot behind the scenes. You really don't know. They're not very uh, upfront about it because of the security cl clearance and stuff like that. But behind the scenes, they will let stuff leak out. For example, uh, Obama in the last couple of days had 12 million pages of CIA files that were released. There was some UFO stuff that was released a couple of days before he left the, the White House. And you see that kind of stuff where they're doing the best they can. They can't they can't be seen to be active, but in behind the scenes, they're doing stuff. I wonder what any of these presidents know about the Roswell incident, if they were ever briefed on oh, that. Well, Trump talked about it He because his son was very interested. Uh, Donald uh, Jr. asked him, 
and and he he asked him. He said, "Oh, there's some really interesting stuff." But then when you hear the documents that have been that have been rumored around that he being caught with at Mar-a-Lago, there's 13 documents there that are so highly classified that the departments that have the documents will not allow them to be part of the court process because they're highly classified. They don't even want the people to know where the documents came from. So I don't know whether you had the UFO document there. That was the whole thing that people thought he would release it. But I mean, I had even the thing where. People were saying, oh, the president doesn't know. You're not going to tell him. And I, I was brought in to brief that some high level uh, fundraiser for Donald Trump brought me in from Pennsylvania. And he said, well, you got to help me. we got to give this briefing for Trump and we got to tell him where the stuff is. I said, I don't know where the stuff is. How am I going to know where the bodies are? Like, I'm a Canadian. Come on. And then I said, they're not going to tell him. I said, what do you mean? They're not going to tell him. What do you mean? Who's not going to tell him? He said, well, the people. I said, well, it's his CIA director. I mean, if he hires his own CIA director and the guy doesn't tell him whose fault is that, he hires the NSA guy. If that doesn't tell him, they're your people. You could fire whoever you want, put all your own people. And if they're not telling them, that's your problem. And so then he said, I never thought about that. <laughs> so uh, that's the thing. But I, I, I did have one study that I can, I can release that uh, I'll eventually do a book on it. But uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson. And that's what I think is actually going on. Lyndon Johnson, uh, there was, a, there was a, a study done by Lyndon Johnson and it was done for uh, McDonald. Uh, it was a, a researcher from University of Arizona and he had, was friends with the president and he wanted a study. So the president actually did a study and they did, they had all these high level people, same guys, same type of people that To the Stars used. Uh, head of uh, Skunk Works, the head of uh, the, the Weird Desk, uh, two-star general, Wright Patterson Air Force, the same levels of people. And they did the study and they basically came up with exactly what the government is saying right now. Yes, UFOs are real. It's absolutely, it's hardware. They're as real as can be. And we haven't got a clue what's going on beyond that. And I've got the actual report that was that was done by the, the guy that did the report. He was going to write a book on it and he ended up dying. And his daughter gave me the files, the files of this half-finished manuscript. And that's what the report says. That's what I think actually goes on. Yes, the presidents do know this is for real. But in terms of, of the actual stuff, nobody really knows because it's got this consciousness interface thing to it. It's the same as you can fly the crap. And if you did the Wilson leak document, this document that I got onto the Internet, the Wilson leak document at the very end, people say, oh, it's counterintelligence. They're throwing off uh, the Admiral Wilson. And it says uh, abductions. There are no abductions, which I agree. It's not what you think it is. There's an event, but it's not what you think it is. And the other one is they say we have a craft and we think it will fly. That's the whole Bob Lazar story. We, we have a craft and we think it will fly. And that, as soon as I saw that, I said, I know what's going on. They've got an intact craft that was given to them and they can't turn it on because you need a consciousness interface everybody's flown the craft says the same thing the craft is alive the craft is conscious you put your hand on a panel you become one with the craft and whatever you think is what the craft thinks and whatever you think you want to do that's what the craft will do and it's this idea that you can have a craft and you can't turn it on until you've got a consciousness interface and that's where they're stuck they're stuck from 1947 they've had a craft and they cannot figure out how this thing works because it, it has nothing it's not there's no engine in the craft there's none of that kind of stuff and that's where we're, we're missing the boat is this, this consciousness thing but it's starting to you see more and more people talking about consciousness about portals and i i spent a lot of time looking at portal story i think if the government has has any technology they have portal technology they understand this idea of portal technology and i was actually uh, uh got an indirect um uh, word from uh ron pandolfi from the cia he was going to send a friend of his to mount shasta because i was going there and these um, mission rama people if you know who they are can open these zendra portal type things they wanted and and i got him on camera where he actually said, and so many times they've been caught on camera, he says, everybody has wondered what it's like to go into the next world. Soon, uh, his friend John is sitting, that when John goes to the desert, a number of us here will go into the next world and come back again. He says this on camera. And that's this whole idea, is the thing is not this, we're flying from one planet to another, it's all one thing, and you're absolutely flipping from one place to another just by this consciousness thing. It's not what people think it is. It's all consciousness. And so I, I do think they have consciousness technology. They understand that part. Or I, I do in my book of apports, they understand 1974 already with apports that have stuff falling out of ceilings for poltergeists and UFO experiencers and psychics and stuff like that. They said, if we can get the apport technology to work, the 1974, they said, we can go to the enemy safe. We can go into the safe. We can get the documents, take them back to Washington, photocopy the documents, put them back, and they will never know we were there. So, yeah, they're working on this stuff. Or the Skinwalker Ranch, they put the four bulls inside the trailer. So skin, they go to Skinwalker Ranch. They're not looking for UFOs. They're trying to figure out how the heck did they put four bulls inside a trailer that was locked? 
And that's what they're looking at is this this technology of this inter not interdimensional, but this idea that they, they, there's something wrong with our idea of how reality works and that you go and look at the phenomena. And so more and more now, I think we're you're starting to see people talk about consciousness. And uh, when I did it in 2012, when I had the consciousness download, people thought I was nuts. You went from the president to the consciousness thing. I, I can't believe you've done this. People thought I had absolutely lost my mind. And I said, well, I didn't actually go to the consciousness thing. I kind of got teleported there. There was no doubt it was like it was such a, uh, an event in my head it was just like oh my everything just sort of stopped and for two days i couldn't think and and so i've been shifted by whatever shifted me and i've been shifted more and more to this consciousness thing all the time and i, I get absolute uh, clear impressions about what book to do next what they what, what they want and it's always going towards this reality thing and less and less ufos all the time the ufos may be like the owls they're not important they they they, they don't matter they're just a symbol on the door. They're to get you to look. They're, they're getting your curiosity right uh, aroused. So you're going to look and open the door and then you're going to learn something else. And you need another symbol and you just keep going from symbol to symbol. And you, as you go along, you're gradually going to figure out uh, it's not the world you thought it is. And they're they're getting us to do our own homework. Well, Grant, um, you've given us um, a lot of your time right now. So I just want to say thank you so, so much for that as well and for to just what you've shared with us. It's very, very interesting. Not many researchers, if you want to call yourself that, you know, go down this road. Yeah. And it's enlightening to hear what you had to say. So I really appreciate you giving us your time. Please know that. So uh, just thank you so, so much for coming on today. Yeah. Well, thanks for your interest, and hopefully one or two people will pick up something and uh, and move the ball ahead. That's all we can do. Is is you? Uh, it's a game of you know score a touchdown, but everybody does their little piece. And the the way we do it is with the oneness principle that we are like eighty five thousand trillion cells in the human body who all do exactly what they're supposed to do. And the way we win this game is we all work together and we all go into the the football huddle and we don't say don't tell me what to do. I'll do whatever I want. We all do exactly what we're supposed to do. And when we all work together, we will solve the mystery.